Great. Uh, great to see you all here. Um, my name is Daniel Barber. For those of you who don't know me, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I also chair the PhD program in architecture. Um, it's a, I'm going to do a very quick introduction to our guest today, and we're going to hear an amazing talk. And then at the end, um, I want to encourage everybody to come up with some questions. Um, and if you want to ask a question, please unmute and uh, turn on your camera so that we can see you and, and bring you into the sort of visual field of the discussion as well. Okay, so it's my very great pleasure to welcome V. Mitch McEwen to Penn and to the Surface Summer School Lecture Series this evening. Um, again, I'm gonna do this very quickly. Mitch has a, a hard stop at 7.30. Um, so I don't want to waste your time listening to me. Um, uh, Mitch is an assistant professor at the Princeton School of Architecture, where she runs the Black Box Research Group. Uh, she's also co-founder of uh, AN Office. Am I supposed to say it like that? You can correct me. Uh, uh, an architectural collaborative with studios in Detroit, New York, and Princeton. Uh, they did an amazing project for the American Pavilion at the 2016 Venice Biennale and also have collaborated on the Jefferson Chalmers Neighborhood Framework Plan in Detroit. Uh, she also has one of the most vital Twitter feeds in the field, if I dare say, and I'm gonna attach to the chat, uh, drop into the chat a bunch of links of the uh, material that I just mentioned. Um, um, and other than that, we're super happy to have the chance to hear from her. I'll let uh, Mitch take it away. Go for it. Oh, so you're, mu you're muted. Yes, yes, okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so I think I'm gonna start by just sharing screen. Um, and we might, we might be interrupted by my two-year-old at some point, um, but we're, I'm just gonna kind of launch into to the talk here with the share screen. Bum, bum, bum. Now it's always tricky when you go to present view. Bum, bum, bum. Let me, I'm just gonna do a test and ask, did you see the slide change or no? Yes, yes. See that you're seeing, okay, okay, great. Okay, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give a talk and it's gonna be brief, but I'm, I'm going to give um, a talk that is kind of synthesizing two pandemics. Um, one is COVID and one in, in a way it, it approached very quickly and we're all, we've been responding to it very quickly. I'm gonna talk about the rapidity and what that means in architecture um, and, and, and the work that I've done in relationship to, to what became a rapid PPE project um, through black box. But I'm also gonna talk about white supremacy as another pandemic, as a kind of a much slower pandemic. And I think it can feel urgent at this moment because in this country we are we are you know in dialogue with a, with an uprising, um, and so I just I just want to start just just with this question of how am I even available to give this talk, um, and and just to put some numbers out there, um, you know, in terms of if you look at licensed architecture, I think it's it's not everything, but it's a good it's it's a good um, just kind of benchmark of the numbers, and out of a hundred thousand licensed black licensed architects, only 1% only are black. So if you think about it in terms of sheer numbers, um, you gotta go with grandma. In terms of sheer numbers, um, you know, for every, every sort of 99 architects out there wondering how to respond in this moment in the built environment, there's only one black architect that's kind of, you know, answering all those 99 questions. Um, but I think, you know, what I, what I wanna do um, is just acknowledge that I'm giving this talk you know, sort of while my kid is crawling on my lap and, you know, at a moment when, um, you know, I really am interested in engaging with students who are working on, on, on COVID responses. Um, and I don't want this to, to be taken as sort of my typical public lecture. So I'm going to point you to two of my more typical public lectures um, that are in more of these kind of these situations where I'm, you know, being compensated for a public lecture and it's an auditorium and we're not dealing with sort of two situations, intense situations at one time. And I also wanna say, you know, for those who are interested in sort of questions of blackness at this moment, um, there is work to be done sort of in the archives. I wanna give a shout out to Madam Architect for not asking me for a comment, but rather just kind of taking their platform, going back in their archive and, and reposting from a conversation I had with them two years ago and realizing that that conversation I had with them two years ago was in some ways prescient and in some ways just relevant. 
um, relevant both because we're in the midst of this other very slow pandemic of white supremacy, and also because I, I had been connecting the dots between the failures of, of democracy and the kind of work that Arthur Ticker had been doing for autocrats. Um, so I just, I wanna say kind of two things, kind of, you know, one, one go in the archives, um, try not to ask black people to do more knowledge making in this moment, um, use that to kind of, use that impetus to kind of go into the archives. Um, and, I, and I want to then kind of talk kind of theoretically also about um, when we talk about space, how is it that when we're talking about responding to COVID, that that does open up broader questions of society and why it is that I wanna put these two pandemics in relationship to each other. Um, I'm, I, I like Lefebvre in relationship to this question of what is social practice? Um, because there's a way in which Lefebvre posits social practice in relationship to representations of space. And, and this question, I, I wanna connect Lefebvre and Du Bois, actually, because I do think that they actually, they, they, they think together, even if they were not in dialogue with each other. And, and by that, I mean that Du Bois was working on statistical space. Um, he was also writing these short fictions um, that were staging um, these kind of technologies. And Lefebvre's argument that space, whether it's a mathematical space or an urban space, that, that it's, it's always whatever is being staged in those spaces can be um, sort of thought in relationship to each other and in some ways are already in relationship to each other because they're already spatial. I think when you look at Du Bois's, um, these, uh, these statistical spatial diagrams, um, you're understanding already um, something like the potential of the, the black population in the South to have some kind of potential energy sort of leaping off the page, right? There's a reason that that's drawn like a spring or, or the way that he charts um, this kind of, you know, th this rupture in society that's emancipation that actually shows you the weight of slavery on the page, right? That that one moment is not gonna change everything. I wanna, I wanna connect that to um, the kinds of more conceptual work that we're maybe more accustomed to in, in terms of how we're trained as in, in, in architecture, which is obviously incredibly European oriented. Um, in something like the Bauhaus, this is a diagram from Hilbersheimer, um, where he was looking at the, the distribution um, this is the Midwest, I've rotated it sideways. Um, but looking at the distribution of, of these are points of potential H-bomb blasts, right? This is part of the argument for dispersing the city. Um, you know, this is, Hilbersheimer is drawing this as if everything is dispersed evenly. Well, the reason I wanna put these sort of two pandemics um, into one talk today, um, and really I'm addressing the students more than the public here, um, is, is that nothing is ever distributed evenly. Right, so, so Hilbersheimer, he gives us these metrics, he gives us this, this way of seeing this on the page, right? It's the potential of an H-bomb blast. It becomes the potential of, of, of suburban, um, you know, the kind of dispersion of the urban population in the mid 20th century in this country, which of course becomes white flight. So nothing is ever actually distributed evenly. Um, so, so I'm gonna give you some, these are, the, these are the one, two, three, four, five tactics I'm gonna walk through in terms of um, design that I want you to, um, to, to sort of take away in relationship to this question of how, how to work in relationship to multiple pandemics at once, how to work in situations where actually nothing is distributed evenly, um, and how to do that in a way um, where, I, I guess one thing that I, that I, I, I do need to say um, that I left out is when you think about, again, why am I even able to give this talk? Why am I not sort of too busy to give this talk? Because I am too busy to give this talk. One of, one of the things that's not distributed evenly in architectural practice is, is even the capacity to do design work, right? If you think about the, the, the wealth in this country, um, the average, the, the typical white household has a net worth of about $170,000. The typical black household has a net worth of $17,000. If you think about just kind of like typical price per square foot, if you're building something cheap, 150 square foot, that means the typical white household has the capacity just in their net worth to build a thousand square feet of something. Depending upon where you are, a thousand square feet would invite possibly an architect, right? Um, the, if you translate that into the black typical network, you're talking about building less than a hundred square feet. There's no role for an architect in that, right? So when you talk about who is building for whom and why, we're already talking about a situation that's not evenly distributed in this country. Um, so we need these other tactics, right? We can't always be, speculating can't always mean starting from a tabula rasa 
coming up with a wonderful form and then plopping it down someplace. And I think we know that, but I, I, wanna, I wanna charge that even more because I think sometimes when we're in these sort of rapid situations or these situations of a lot of transformation, it's, 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 um, we need to be even more precise. Um, so these are, the, these are the five tactics I'm gonna, I'm gonna put um, out there today. Um, so the first one is cut. Um, this is very much, this is work that I did in Detroit and it's very much informed by Keller Easterling's ideas about subtraction, but I want to kind of own up that I think in, in a way the main project that I'm going to show you is more formal than what Keller Easterling is putting on the table. Um, and there are ways that my, my work at the urban scale, I think, does subtraction, but I think this is more cut. So anyways, I want to first kind of talk about, um, so in Detroit, um, there's a situation of these excessive vacancies and, and demolitions of the typical single family house which is often in the national rhetoric talked about as a kind of failure of, you know, Detroit, which is a, you know, parenthetical failure of black urbanism, right? And I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. in the 80s when it was a majority black city. Um, and I, I, know, I know the riches of, of, of being in a black city, you know, before I moved to Detroit, that, that I grew up in a black city. Um, and I know the way that these narratives operate because I, I lived, you know, growing up in D.C. when it was the, known as the murder capital of this country. Um, and so, so Detroit, the, 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 what challenges Detroit at the urban scale in the built environment is actually really the single family house. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a city um, that most of the, the building logic was actually informed by, by Ford and by these kind of Fordist strategies. And so you have this kind of repeated single family house and then you have a lot of extraction to the suburbs. I don't think I have time today to go into the abstraction to the suburbs, but you can, you can see that story in um, the book that Laura Kurgan and Dare put out from Columbia University Press, Ways of Knowing Cities, um, my chapter on watercraft. But so here, what I'm gonna show you is looking at um, these single family houses that become demolished, they're vacant, they become these brownfields. Um, and so literally every time you see a circle, it's tagged as a brownfield. Um, I'm starting to chart um, within these terms of vacancy um, where this sort of single family house is, is, is populated in these terms of vacancies and where it's adjacent to then what becomes tagged as a, as a brownfield. And, and this was the first project that I did in Detroit, which was to work on one of these um, single family houses. And the goal was to really question what could become public. And I think if you're working on this question of COVID, I think it's important to recognize that the sort of um, you know, homo economicus, you know, that notion of a, of a person as this individual that's sort of self-sustaining and just kind of consumes things to optimize and live completely falls apart, right, in terms of this pandemic of COVID, right? We, we know that actually whether somebody else has a mask in public is directly going to affect us. We know that even if we feel fine, we might be a vector of the virus, right? We know that sort of these relationships, these personal relationships of who we're proximate to and how have effects not just on us, but on the, the whole, a whole city, right? A whole economy, a whole region. And that these things can spread so fast, right? Um, so, so, so what I was interested in with this first project in Detroit was how to sort of take that map, right? Of this, this citywide reality and make the object of the building do something in relationship to that urban scale. Um, specifically, take something that was pseudo public on paper and make it operate in a pseudo public way in its, in its built reality. Um, so the main operation to do that, again, I'm saying it's cut because it was a little bit formal in terms of making the stage and something almost like a proscenium, but it was very much interested, interested in how much we could produce by subtracting, how much we could produce by um, spending almost all the money on labor and almost nothing on materials, um, how much we could, we could generate as a potential um, from one of these uh, balloon frame houses by understanding its logic and then, and then adapting that logic to, um, uh, to, to make space for culture, basically, to make state space for, for public performance. So it, it, it was called house opera because I was interested in opera being actually the Latin word for work. It was called house opera because music is a big part of Detroit. Detroit gave us um, techno music, gave us um, so much. So we cut out a floor with a balloon frame, you can do that. Um, we wrapped the outside in Tyvek. We were playing with this idea of kind of construction site as something that could, um, these, kind of, these kind of liminal realities of building as something that could actually hold a kind of public um, space, a kind of public image, a kind of public surface. And so we partnered, and this is an early Ann office project, we, uh, we partnered with uh, a local curator who ended up running for mayor a couple years after this. 
um, named Ingrid Lafleur, who hosted a, a festival called Siggy Fest. And, and, and basically, so we were able to cut out most of the second floor, um, op open up the, remove a wall. And, and we were able to do this, um, just kind of, you know, sistering joists and things like that, because the logic of the balloon frame is actually really flexible, right? You, you have the walls are freestanding, and then the floors in those are not really stacked, they're kind of slotted into those freestanding walls. Um, so the second, the second um, sort of tactic, I guess, or I don't know, somewhere between tactic and strategy. I, I like the word attitude. I feel like in architecture, we don't give ourselves leeway to have attitude. Or maybe we, I don't know, we have attitude in the wrong way. Um, so yeah, I guess the second attitude slash tactic I want to share is augment. And this was again concerned with balloon frame. This was staged in a museum though. So I could be a bit more kind of open-ended with the materials and with the form. Um, and so this was the, the kind of secondary question of, you know, how to think through both that kind of rupture in the joist and then also that kind of external wrapping in a way that um, maybe could do more than just Tyvek paper. Um, and so this was working with foam um, because I'm very interested in air, like the, the Venice Biennale project that, that Daniel mentioned was entirely obsessed with, with air and air quality and, 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 and making a structure that could participate in changing air quality at the border, because Detroit's a border city with, with Canada. Um, and so here, this foam, uh, we cut with a hot wire. I think I'm gonna show you another hot wire robotic cutting. Yeah, I'm gonna show you a chair also. Um, but we cut this as a way of thinking about a very lightweight form slash surface that could augment this typical um, reality of the balloon frame. Um, so we went through a series of operations and, and basically let the kind of the, the simple logic of the hot wire do the formal editing for us. And then this became a way of then just kind of playing with also the, the representation of how this could be repeated by, by showing also these kind of models. Um, and, and it became a way also of staging, this was at the same time as the Venice Biennale, and so we actually had a film that was, um, that was recorded in Venice of people looking at the model of Detroit and Venice. Uh, that became an augmented reality for the, for the Detroiters who visited this, so we kind of turned the, the lens, we turned the gaze back. Um, I think it's important, uh, I, I guess I can group that together with this question of augmentation, sort of when we, when we are able to turn the gaze back, right? Um, I think there's been a lot of conversation now about um, facial recognition software and different logics of surveillance. It, it is important when, as architects, when we do participate in things like, like public health, we're so close to data gathering. Um, it's important where we can stage these, these reversals, where we're able to, you know, turn the, turn the gaze back so that the data that's being gathered, you know, might be on the, might be on the, the, the governance, might be on the federal government and all of its crimes, right, instead of the kind of everyday people on the street. Um, so, and I don't say federal government broadly, I mean this specific administration. Um, so embody. Um, Embody, I, I think, you know, working on embodiment, working at the scale of chairs, I think is something that is actually, it's really important for architects. I mean, I think, I think the reason architects work on chairs is not just to do these kind of signature objects, but to really think about embodiment and work on an embodiment in a different, more tactile um, way. And so this was a chair where, again, you know, working on foam, kind of obsessed with, with light weight um, and, and things made of air. Oh, I was concerned with a chair that could sort of deliver itself. This was commissioned for an exhibit at Storefront for Art and Architecture. And, and the idea was it had to be within a certain cheap price point. Um, this was Leong Leong put together this, this brief. Um, and it had to be within a certain cheap price point, but I wanted to really think that price point also in terms of how, not just how the body lands in this chair, but also how this chair delivers itself. You know, we, we talk about you know, carbon footprint and things like that. And it, and it can seem, it often is, I think, a very accounting logic. You know, I, I, I'm interested in sort of how materials arrive places. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think there's like, um, you know, there, uh, anyways, it's, it's, I think there's more of a narrative sometimes to how materials arrive places, not just something that you can reduce to one number. Um, so, so wanting to design this chair sort of out of the materials that it would be delivered in. Um, and, then, and then it's called, we ended up calling this, I think I should just say I, because I'm the only one who come up with this name. I ended up calling this the hot grandma chair, um, because it, again, the foam is cut by a hot wire. And then it's covered in plastic um, to uh, basically as, as referencing that intelligence of grandmothers. I don't know if your grandmother covered 
her sofa in plastic, but my, my grandmother covered her sofa in plastic. And if you think about these kind of, and I'm not a populist, right? But if you think about these, these tactics, these kind of everyday tactics that are often so outside of what we deal with in terms of aesthetics and architecture, um, they, can, they can offer so much intelligence. If you think about wrapping something in plastic in order to kind of preserve it, how different that is from the kind of flat packing Ikea way that uh, we think about kind of popular furniture to, today. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to connect um, this lightweight um, deliverable, this chair that kind of cuts itself from its delivery materials with the intelligence of the grandmother who, who kind of preserves the, the sofa with plastic. Um, and of course, we could replace this body. I mean, this ergonomic body, it's always the same kind of male body. Um, I mean, part of working with, with robots, um, you know, is also the possibility of being able to, to um, iterate in ways that are always different. We know that algorithms can do that. Um, but part of what I like about working with robots in terms of materials is that, you know, you can come up with these kind of curves and these paths, and they actually register something um, that is so much more dynamic when they meet, um, when they meet the, the kind of friction of the material, when they meet the, um, the slumping of something like a, even as simple as a, as a hot wire. Um, so now I'm gonna slow down a little bit because now I'm getting closer to, I think the terms, more direct terms of, of maybe the, the, the kinds of methods that you might be bringing to this question. Um, I think you're, you're designing um, a, a kind of a COVID testing facility, um, which, you know, if you think about it, it's probably on the speed of designing a, or, or kind of producing a vaccine, right? It's something that's gotta be done. It's gotta be super intelligent. It's gotta be figured out very quickly. And, and if it works, it has to be able to be delivered to this vast country of 300 million people, right? It's kind of this, this huge question. Um, so the last two sort of attitudes slash tactics that I wanna put out there, I think choreography is, um, is relevant for what you're doing, right? Because you're not just making an object. You're dealing with choreography at the level of, you know, again, the real specificity of, of how and when people are breathing or possibly spitting on each other, right? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of what comes down to this aerosol, you know, it's really this kind of threat of this vector of spit that can travel a certain distance before its own weight brings it down in an arc of gravity, right? So you're, really, you're, you're designing to that, that specificity. Um, and at the same time, you're, you're, you're designing something that has to be thought as a process, right? Because similar to the vaccine, right? It has, to be, it has to be sort of produced at the same time that its possibility of being distributed is, is also being designed. Um, so I, I've worked a num in, with choreography a number of ways, um, going back to my early work in Brooklyn when I was running this gallery called Superfront. Um, what I've been able to do, this is a shot obviously not recent. I mean, I shouldn't say obviously not recently. This could have been yesterday. Right, but it's from the 1950s. Um, this photo, and it's um, it's at the lab at Princeton, um, where Buckminster Fuller um, staged some of his his work in this building that's called the Labitude. Um, so that's that's Bucky Fuller with with students there. Um, I think his first geodesic dome, maybe not his first, definitely his his prototype Damascene car he built here. One of these first geodesic domes he built, and now this is a space that I've been staging work in for the past year. Um, and the first sort of big project that I did there, we built a dance floor in that space. Um, and I did, a, I did a collaboration with a choreographer from Burkina Faso named Olivia Tapanga. And the questions that we were dealing with um, have to do with robotics, um, have to do with artificial intelligence, um, but also just have to do with um, relationships between um, sort of elements and, and narratives across distance. Um, and so the distance that Olivier was, was, was really, I guess Olivier and I were bringing to this, this, this project was, was a distance from Burkina Faso to a Detroit or a DC in the 1960s. So he, he came up with this piece called When, when Birds Refused to Fly. And it was concerned with um, 67, 68, around that time. <clears throat> and he wanted to stage um, a relationship that really is, is it's more understood through music, this kind of dialogue um, between the US, between Black America, really, and West Africa, specifically Burkina Faso, in this moment of, of kind of decolonization. And, and, and it came to me because he was, he was working with these elements that he was calling these, these wood elements bricks. Um, and so, so what we came up with was, 
rather than an object, um, a set of relationships. Um, so, so we kind of scaled this element so that it, it, it could operate more like a brick. It's scaled to be the, the Roman, the Roman um, dimension of a brick, which is actually, I think, where we get the British foot from because it's 12 inches. Um, and, so, and so with these different sort of strategies, these scripts, I really worked with him in a way as if we were designing algorithms together. Um, Olivier then created these different moments on stage uh, for the dancers to, to build these, these different sort of walls or, or threads. Um, and at the same time, I've been um, developing um, in, that, in that Labitude space, um, a kind of indoor GPS system for drones to be able to pick up these same elements. Um, and he completely changed the way that I'm, I'm designing that system by, by working with him. I guess I think one of the lessons I would want to highlight there is, because I, I was going to show you drones and then I took them out, um, is, is really be ready for your design when it's distributed to be radically changed, right? That, 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 that might be sort of something that you build into the process. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to linger on this. I'm ending a bit early because I have to do a hard stop at 7.30. Um, so I wanted to have time for questions and comments. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to linger on this last part of Respond because this is my work, um, what became the Rapid PPE project uh, at Black Box at, at Princeton. Um, so this is something that I, I didn't include the slide that would show you the, what is it called? It's called Midnight Charette. Midnight Charette. Um, you, if you look up Midnight Charette, I had a dialogue with, with, with Alvin and, and Ginny Sabin about this PPE project. But, but basically in March, um, you know, when it, when it became clear that, um, that universities would be, would be shutting down in-person instruction, um, I, I, I got very concerned. And this also is something you can, you can track on Twitter as far as what, what Daniel Barber mentioned. My, my, oh, my Twitter handle is Mitch McEwen. It's just my name with no space, Mitch McEwen. And on Instagram, I think it's the real Mitch McEwen. But, but on Twitter is where I started getting vocal about the role that architects could have in this pandemic, really out of um, a kind of frustration with the, this void in national leadership. You know, as far as I, I think what really kicked it off for me was there was a, a tweet from the AIA. And I have to say, tweeting is not the thing that AIA does best. I have, I have criticism. I can criticize the AIA for different things, but it's a, it's a little bit low-hanging fruit to criticize their Twitter feed because it's just, it's clearly, it's not really what they're focused on, which I understand. I mean, why they can't staff it better, I don't know. But at some point, they, they started putting out a book list for architects to read, you know, to say, you know, while you're taking time off um, from work and you're at home, here's a list of books to relax with. And it just seems so irresponsible that in the middle of this national crisis, you know, a national organization that is, is supposed to provide guidance for a profession that is a fairly well-resourced profession, um, people who have a lot of skills um, to just kind of unplug and, and just sort of act like, oh, hands off, it's somebody else's problem, um, I, I, th I thought was, was, was actually disgraceful. So, so what I started doing was um, trying to figure out uh, in, my, in my role in terms of the work that I do as an academic, how to take those resources available in your typical architecture studio um, obviously, Princeton, the lab, has, has facilities that are beyond what's typical. You know, what it is that, that we could do. Um, and, and clearly, one of the major crises in, in this pandemic has been PPE. To connect the dots again between the, the, this, this recent quick pandemic and the slower pandemic of white supremacy that, that I started off with, people, you know, recently have been comparing side by side how the police are outfitted with the, the kind of typical gear of the police on the streets with how we have seen our medical professionals outfitted. Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a travesty. It, but but it's, it's a travesty that I, I think those of us who, who work with materials and with quantification and with images um, need to be participating in the analysis of, as well as, as, well as disrupting and changing and reimagining. Um, you know, the, the doctors, when you saw the doctors at Mount Sinai wearing garbage bags, to do this work, I started, I started researching the CDC guidelines. Um, if you go to box.princeton.edu, that's the, that's the website for the, the Princeton Black Box Research Group. Um, and the first thing that comes up is this rapid PPE. You'll see there's a kind of 10 page, maybe by now 20 page, I don't remember how many page document, that's sort of summarizing all the research that, that went into figuring out what the position 
should be um, for these different PPE categories. And much of the CDC guidelines, I think now we know the extent to which the, the CDC um, has been um, sort of, I don't even want to say perverted because I think we should celebrate perversion. I think the CDC has been sort of co-opted into, um, you know, the, the sort of executive White House, um, you know, um, priorities. So, so anyways, we see that now, right? The way the CDC has been silenced. But, but even, even early in March, when there were guidelines about, about who should wear masks or who should not wear masks, the, sciences, the scientists were not the ones who were defining what was distributed to the public. So if you, if you were looking at the, so the CDC was distributing what, what they called contingency guidelines. And some of the contingency guidelines around PPE were things like wear the same, um, you know, protective garment until it's soiled, until it's visibly soiled, right? And if you think about that in terms of just vectors of contagion, if you think about that just from the logic of architecture and surfaces and contact, right? I mean, I think one thing that's important about this work is to recognize the extent to which we do have the training to, to not to, to understand abstractly how the coronavirus works at the level of antibodies, right? But when we know certain dimensions, like six feet, when we're told certain things like aerosol and, and projectile spitting, or we understand that there's certain amount of time that the virus can live on a surface, we can translate these things into terms that we understand as architects, right? Because some of this is just relationship between, between space and, and surfaces, which is, which is a lot of what we do. So anyways, um, the CDC guidelines for contingency, for low PPE contingency, and again, PPE means um, the, the, the protective equipment, personal protective equipment, was basically a recipe for spreading COVID amongst patients, right? It was a recipe for, for, for care providers to be having the same masks and the same garments around different patients all day long. So, so it became really clear to me that, that increasing PPE um, for hospitals would be really critical in this. Uh, I think it, was, it became clear to everybody. It was just a question of sort of what to do. Um, and so very early on, um, then in addition to this, this long report, um, we basically honed in on the face shield as the, as the actual element of PPE that um, seemed to be both most critical and something that um, could be produced with the equipment of an architectural lab without opening up the, the possibility of, um, you know, uh, sort of the, 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 basically the problem of, of 3D printed sort of DIY surfaces at the level of the mask are really difficult, but at the level of the face shield, um, it's, it's fairly simple. So what you're looking at on the screen, it's a long preamble to explain what you're looking at on the screen, is two different models of a face shield, um, both of which you can find the, the fabrication details on box.princeton.edu. The one on the right, you can find many places. It's um, Ginny Sabin at Cornell, really spearheaded an effort to get this produced up and down the East Coast. This is what's called the 3D Verkstand model. The one on the left, um, I, I think we were, we were one of the few places to really start distributing this model. The one on the left is called the MCQN. It's out of uh, Liverpool, England. And we, um, we worked with ER, and really, well, there are two ER doctors. There was a collective called Princeton PPE Collective that got us in touch with ER doctors that basically just adjusted this for the American reality. And the American reality at the time was they were wearing a lot of ad hoc headgear. So we just kind of made the strap longer. Um, and at the same time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with um, sort of what was an, an ambition that I might, I might come back to, um, to really look at other face PPE that could um, work with the, the face shield. Right now, I'm just still focused on distributing, now that the hospitals are in a better situation, um, I'm personally focused, and I think everyone in the Princeton PPE has kind of gone their own direction to kind of prioritize what, what what is happening, I think, at their level of the community here. And I think it's important to sometimes do that too, right? Sometimes you have to be super organized amongst the collective and sometimes you have to then kind of disperse and, and, and have the agency to kind of decide your own priorities. Um, at this point, since we're kind of opening back up again, I'm gonna go back, even though you looked at the slide for so long, I'm gonna go back to it. The one on the left, that face shield on the left, um, what I've started doing is distributing that to retail workers here because especially with the economy opening back up, um, the retail workers and folks working in restaurants 
are exposed more than anybody else. Uh, and so into giving them the face shield offers significantly more protection than just the mask that they're required to wear. Um, but I have also been, been working on um, alternatives to mask, um, a face harness, which basically, I'm gonna, it's kind of awkward, I think, to show yourself. Um, I, I guess I do want to end with this kind of awkwardness because I think it's something that when you're doing work like this, when you're doing work, so basically the idea here is that you can replace the actual mask because this is one of the big issues is that if you're wearing a fabric mask um, and you're not able to wash it after you come into contact with somebody, then you're actually potentially then spreading the virus. And so it's better to be able to just dispose and swap um, and so this is, um, this is a, a face harness with just a, like a pocket square handkerchief, but it could also be um, with fabric inserts. We have, we have some materials that we've been kind of prototyping, like shop cloths and things like that, which, I mean, the whole country has been doing this DIY work because we're in a situation where the, the federal leadership is entirely corrupt and not, not democratic. Um, so, so, but I think, you know, when you're doing this kind of DIY work, I think two things that I want to kind of close with. One, it's important to connect it to, um, to critique, right? So that you're not falling into the situation where um, you're producing something that covers up for the crisis of austerity, um, the crisis of corrupt, um, you know, sort of federal governance, all these, all these crises, the crisis of white supremacy. Doing the work in a way that doesn't, that doesn't act as a band-aid to, to cover up the systemic issues is one. So, so in connecting it always to the, to the critique um, and to this, these bigger imaginative issues of, of what an actual kind of functioning just society would look like. And then the second thing is doing that in a way that lets your own subjectivity participate in it. You know? so, so if you're thinking about COVID um, and, and you're thinking about building a, a kind of a rapid thing, think about it on your own block first. This is something that I really learned from the, the maskers especially before we're doing this, in order to do this prototype design. Um, I, I read and, and sort of reviewed a lot of the masking, uh, you know, websites and exchanges and talked to some maskers. And, and one of the things that the maskers do is they, they work with their own block first, right? They work with their own families, the households, neighbors, blocks, institutions. I think that's something we can really learn from in architecture. I think sometimes we really think of the model of success still as this kind of, you know, helicopter hovering, you know, sort of I'm no place invisible eyeball of the transcendentalist model. Um, I think, you know, as awkward as it is, we, we really, you know, need to put ourselves into it, our own. And again, this kind of question of attitude, I think, um, not, not ourselves only as these kind of, um, you know, asthetes, right, but ourselves also as people who are vulnerable, also as people who might get sick, right, also as people who, who, who you know, who, who go to certain wine shops and go to certain restaurants and, and want those people to be healthy, right. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna close. I'm gonna close in case there's questions. Wow, that was amazing, Mitch. I, I'm, uh, I think everybody is is well uh, equally sort of floored and impressed and, and excited by so much of what you've put together here. Thank you very much.